current it is. It'll be very, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it works. Completely. In fact, what's what I think is good about his work is I think one of the reasons it holds up is he wasn't trying to prove things. He was trying to find out what is. And that that typically sticks around a little longer than right. what we think is. Right. So I'm going to just put a greeting on uh, onto YouTube. Good evening, everyone. And uh, hey, everybody. And we always have one person here. I, I'm always um, assuming that it's Art Patterson, but I don't know. He's he's actually my. Uh, I think my most loyal follower is Art. Nice. Um, and, um, but anyway, um, any new thoughts since the weekend uh, based on what's been going on here in the collective? You know. No? Well, part of me had a oh boy, the red wave kind of thing. And looking back now, I I feel like I kind of hopped into the propaganda too to try to ignore it even harder. And mm -hmm. instead of just going, mm-hmm, seen it, done it. And as if somehow something was changing and some, you know, something is, I mean, even with the nationalist <clears throat> government being elected across the globe, where you know any kind of government starts to move towards autocracy rather than you know some kind of um, ruler democracy as it were or um, it, so it, I don't know it feels like it's all still in the air um, but I just I don't know I want to hang out with the pesky idealism of maybe we've learned a little bit from history maybe just a little a little but, smidge a little <laughs> smidge and yeah, part I, of it I, knows that just to batten down the hatches and, well, something's coming and whatever's coming, it's coming. So be ready. Right. Well, it's what we have to recognize is that there's always duality. And every everywhere, even where there's autocracy, there's duality. You can see Putin having troubles in Russia, um, even though he has this iron grip on the country right now but it, mm -hmm. you know it only takes one one guy with a with a needle to <laughs> you know stab him with Carrari or something like that and yep. he's gone and uh then something new happens and so you know i always remember got gandhi's comment um you know, there have been tyrants, and for a time they can seem very powerful, but in the end, they always fall. Think of it always. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I any, anyway, so I, I think it'll be fun this evening. I, I do want to cut it short after an hour, but uh, I think it'll be fun to, this evening to see what Jung was saying 100 years ago based on what he was seeing in world war one um and well, you know and i think i i agree and i i think that two two examples i think that are a little more little more modern um are the example you've brought up about you know they go in and do the survey of the indians when the raj is lifted and you know 99 percent of them were like what what raj <laughs> right, and, right. <laughs> you know and it reminds me of when my dad was doing a teaching exchange in Iraq and he got home maybe a day before Desert Storm started, mm -hmm. you know, 91. And, um, but when he was there, um, riding in the back of a vehicle with one of the other professors to dinner or something, um, my dad said, you know, there's a dictator here, but people look like people. Mm -hmm. I would, feel like i should sense more oppression he goes the government is for them um the people they just don't mess with it so right. 
you know, there was a whole, it's almost like a frozen, a frozen river and the water's still running underneath, you know? So in that sense, people just kept their head down. And the professor then said, but there's one thing, if anyone asks you to get into a helicopter, you say no, um, because Saddam Hussein had a, a habit of whenever the number two or number three were getting too uppity or close, <laughs> they just took, they took a helicopter ride and he burnt, you know, he just, just, you know, there you go. That's the last ride they took. Right. And the helicopter would just mysteriously, you know, the Jesus bolt or whatever popped off and mm -hmm. there you go. But, yep. but the people, again, like the Raj, 99% didn't even know about it for yeah. 100 years. And then same with there in Iraq. So there's all, there have always been these, I don't want to in any way support tyrannical or autocratic behavior. But no. at the same time, there's still a people live and breathe and eat and, you know, work and do the stuff they do. And yep. you just have to have a different sense about care, caution, and also speaking up when you need to. Well, I, boy, do I know that having traveled as much as I've traveled in the Arab world um, yeah. and in the Muslim world in general. Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this attempts to free the individuality from the collective psyche, and so this is Dr. Jung writing on this topic a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. but it absolutely applies to us today, I think. And so let's just see what he says, and we'll uh, we'll get mm -hmm. into it fairly well here and. Uh, at least get up to uh, uh, the next the next section. Okay, so uh, the part A of this is the regressive restoration of the perso persona. Now, regressive means you're not advancing any longer in your in you know how awake you are. Okay, mm -hmm. so so I think regressive restoration too would be fall back to regroup as it yeah. were. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, so anyway, okay. Uh, paragraph 471. The unbearable state of identity with the collective psyche drives the patient, as we have said, to some radical solution. Two ways are open to him for getting out of the condition of godlikeness. The first possibility is to try to reestablish regressively the previous persona by attempting to control the unconscious through the application of a reductive theory by declaring, for instance, that it is nothing but repressed and long overdue infantile sexuality, which would really be best replaced by normal sexual function. This explanation is based on the undeniably sexual symbolism of the language of the unconscious and on its concretistic interpretation. Alternatively, the power theory may be invoked and relying on the, equal, the equally undeniable power tendencies of the unconscious, one may interpret the feeling of godlikeness as masculine protest, as the infantile desire for domination and security, or one may explain the unconscious in terms of the archaic psychology of primitives, an explanation that would not only cover both the sexual symbolism and the godlike power strivings that come to light in the unconscious material, but would also seem to do justice to its religious, philosophical, and mythical aspects. Jordan. Or mythological, yeah. It's, um, I think here I, I'm seeing that when he's using infantile sexuality or infantile as an adjective, infantile desire, um, I think it's not meant like infant psychiatry these days. I think it's meant like that pre-symbolic sound where someone has no mastery, no experience, and is in a sense just a fledgling, as it were, um, because the archaic psychology of primitives, um, the power strivings, but there's a piece there with the power strivings where 
it's simply about place in a tribe, except in a tribe, I can see you and everyone else in the tribe. I mean, it's such that if we get around a big campfire, we don't need a stadium. You know, we've got a clearing in the forest. <laughs> right. And so I think that the scale here is interesting, talking about the infantile piece or fledgling, fledgling as I would call it, um, and that masculine protest. And masculine protest is somewhat infantile. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the, you know, I don't want to mow the lawn. I want to go to the pool. You know, right. humph, 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 tantrum, tantrum, tantrum. Four-year-old says no, and then four-year-old says why, and yeah. then says no again. Um, right. So, I, I mean, and thoughts on He made on me this? do it, and <laughs> then he, that he blamed somebody else. He made me do it. Yeah, he made, yeah, exactly. And there's, exactly, so that instead of standing, actually, in solidarity with yourself, right. where, yeah, okay, I messed up, mm -hmm. and... Um, okay, I'm, well, what, what are the consequences? What are the repercussions? How do I feel about it? Okay, everybody messes up, you yeah. know? So I think it's when people understand that mistakes are opportunity and there's actually a logic of failure because yeah. you actually, it's like part of the logic of failure would be a gardener saying, oh my God, I have weeds, I have failed. No, right. the logic of failure would be, okay, that leads to failure, I'll pull the weeds out. Right. And I think that's the opportunity that are, is given across this um, as he starts off with the unbearable state of identity with the collective psyche drives the patient to some radical solution. Well, to become the tallest blade of grass, which is the first to get cut. I mean, right. so you have or, to, or to become a out. mature human being in your society. Now, Michael right. Hasten or Hassan says, um, there is no escaping from the collective unconscious as it encompasses the entire gamut of human behavior. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and I think it's there, like no escape in the ocean when you're swimming in it. But you absolutely. personally can still be personally identifiably swimming front stroke, right. back stroke, side stroke, however you, you know, want to do that. And so I, I do agree you know, with his comment that it's. It's not that we can or can't get away. It's it's a natural presence. So it's even right. beyond can't get away. Right. But it, it also, you know, also in society, in the collective, there are people at every late, uh, level of development, every level of development, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and so... Uh, you know, we cannot escape it, but we also have to recognize that there are po different pockets of the collective mm -hmm. all over the place. I mean, it, it exists in Boy Scout troops, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, it exists at the Masons meeting. Uh, it exists in a church congregation. Everybody in the church congregation has a certain feeling about the church congregation, and it's different from the feeling of the church congregation and every other church, even the ones that, with the same denomination. And mm -hmm. so every time we do something with other people, we develop a collective gestalt, I guess, about that group of people. Mm -hmm. We definitely see it in our advanced reading groups on, on Wednesdays when um, you know, the the group has definitely developed a, a very strong solidarity with one another. And and we definitely uh, want to be together every Wednesday, you know, at four four o'clock Eastern time, which is when we do it. And um, and everybody wants to be there, you know, regardless of where they were two years ago before we started doing it or three years ago, maybe, now we've developed a collective unconscious that says, I want to be there, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and it's true that we are bond in that way, in a collective way, in every group you join, you know, wherever it is. And I like you calling out the, there are all levels of development at all places. And to use the church example, 
I'll give a very personal one. Unfortunately, the two primary other protagonists other than me are dead, so I can say whatever I want and they can't <laughs> defend themselves. But <laughs> so, so instead, I'll say the truth. And that was, I was 19. I was halfway through my architectural five-year architectural program. Mm -hmm. So I was ahead of my game because I had been, I had been um, nominated to be a voting member on a design review committee for a new fellowship hall for the church. Mm -hmm. But who had I been nominated by? Someone who was less developed than his position should assume. And it was the other all-state all center who my dad was the other all-state center for the state championship football team in 56-57. Well, he never forgot it. My dad, you know, he played, but at the same time, this other guy, he had a big gravel business and he made a lot of money, but he was still a terrified little boy trying to control everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, little did I realize, I mean, not putting two and two together because one, I'm 19, you know, back when you knew everything, except that that day I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about conflict of interest. And I didn't know about betrayal, truly. I hadn't truly experienced it, but I was about to. And worse, I was about to experience it personally for me betraying my own boss. Because I didn't even put two and two together that the architect I worked for was the primary ecclesiastical architect for the North, for North Texas. Well, <laughs> so who's going to be the first person presenting? You know, and so... I didn't even think about it. My parents were like, well, you need to get off that committee. It's conflict of interest. And I still didn't get it. And part of it was the naivete of the goodness of people. And no, you know, the, the best will win out, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and well, well, you can say the best will win out, but you better quit your job first. And because imagine the rage in the eyes of my boss when he walked in to present and I'm sitting there in the second seat of the voting committee. Right. And so there you go, that tracks out. Well, my architectural career felt like it was over before I even got out of college. Right. I mean, it, it took six to nine months, I think, to recover. Cause then I immediately afterwards, I had a taste for conflict of interest and I could smell it 10 miles away. Sure. But but I took it on and I didn't blame anyone, but my own, yeah, okay. I had my pesky idealism and I ran forward and everyone told me there are only bullets. There are no, no cotton balls coming the other way, you mm -hmm. know, and, and it's, there you go. But the different levels of development, I have to say that then because of that, because of walking in basically too big for my britches and then meeting up with someone who needed some bigger britches, um, because he had outgrown them, but only by size. And that experience is priceless to me now. I mean, it's, right. I think one of my primary things, but for, you know, six to nine months, very closely, it, it well, was almost yeah. deadly. Yeah. So Justin has made an interesting point here and good evening, Art. Um, so, um, all of us, um, you know, the boss is always an idiot, right? Uh, it, it, invariably, that happens. It's archetypal. It, it happens in any kind of an organization. Uh, and gradually, we have to grow up and realize that there, there's a balance that has to be maintained in order for society to be ma maintained. And so Justin is very accurately um, summed it up summed up our our instinctual what we want especially men but i suppose this is in women also he says but i don't want to behave work all day for the same meager pay take orders from a bitchy boss or do whatever some corrupt extreme politician thinks is right <laughs> We all feel that way, okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, but we have to get beaten <laughs> back. We have to get beaten back a few times in order to realize, you know, where we stand in the real pecking order. And, and so what was going on in our election this year was that, you know, the, the, um, 
the red wave, so called, was basically just the fact that there has been no election since January 6th. So nobody knew how Americans really felt about it. Nobody knew. Okay, for sure. Um, and the bubble went unchecked and grew. Uh-huh. And, and exactly. It went unchecked and grew. And uh, our former president has never had anybody or never accepted anybody saying no to him. So he just goes ahead and bulls himself mm-hmm. his way through. But you know, ultimately, you know, it doesn't work. It's like it's like um, uh, it's like the Battle of the Bulge, right? Where where Hitler puts all his troops up on the line in at, in December of 1944 and blasts through a certain part of the of the uh, Western line, the, the American line, and manages to surround a division in Bastogne. Okay, so the so the Germans think that they've achieved something by doing that. Um and uh and they haven't, okay, because Patton and the rest of the American army and and the power of the Allies and you know, the American war machine and bada be bada bow, all those things were inevitably going to cause Germany to lose the war. And most German generals already knew that, okay? They knew it pretty well by then. Um, and, well, and then the American, the American, typical American military philosophy, oh, we're surrounded cool it's a target rich environment fire at will (laughs) right fire anywhere it will because it's right so so uh general mcauliffe who was trapped in bastone um was told to surrender by the germans and he responded nuts (laughs) and and Patton coming up up uh the road to save him 100 miles away says a man that that eloquent has to be saved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and so what happened is the Germans got beaten as as they would have, even mm-hmm. if even if Bastogne had been destroyed and every man killed, it didn't matter. Germany was gonna lose. The same with Japan. And you know, it, yeah, the atomic bomb in Japan speeded up uh, the end of the war, perhaps a year, but but the the war was going to be over and won by the Americans anyway. That was very clear um, before the bomb, and you know the Allies were just preparing for a huge invasion of the main islands of Japan, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Japanese at the time, they had 15 year old girls with with bamboo spears that were going to that were going to meet the American troops on the on the beaches of Japan. Well, you know, that that wouldn't last very long. Right. But but the Japanese said, well, you know, a million people would have been killed. And so. The fact that Hiroshima killed 100,000 and, well, it's probably over by now, but, you know, there there were, you know, a few thousand dying every year from radiation poisoning all the years that I've been going to Japan since 62. Um, And that is tragic. Okay. And and it, it was tragic then and it's tragic now. However, for the Japanese people, if we had invaded, it would have been far more tragic. And, um, you know, the the issue of the Ukraine war is uh, Putin just doesn't understand that he's beaten. He he can't win this war. OK, even even if he were to occupy all of Ukraine, even if that were to happen, which it won't happen. But if it were to happen, 
there is no way that the Ukrainians would accept it. They would just uh, continue to fight a, a rear guard uh, battle until it, until the Russians left finally. Whether that would take a year or a hundred years, they would keep doing it. Well, in that scenario, there reminds me back to the you know German Germans put in such a single-minded force to penetrate the wall, so to speak, mm -hmm. at that line, the western the western line, western front. And the thing is, single-mindedness in war, in actually in court, in anywhere, is deadly because once once you pierce through a defense. You are single-mindedly focused on, okay, cool. Now you've surrounded that, you know, that group. Well, you're pointed inward yeah. and you're blind and back, 360 degrees blind and back. The nature of surrounding someone puts you actually at more risk because now you potentially have two fronts, the one you've surrounded and the, all the ones that can potentially come from behind you. Yeah. And you know, you just the example of Patton, you know, on the way in hearing that, well, there's that group surrounded, but the whole U.S. forces are surrounded. <laughs> and we're surrounding the German army, right? Right. It's, it's, OK, so let, let's see if we can blast through the next four pages, because um, let's see if we read four pages, we will get yeah, to the end of this seg segment. OK, so yours is 472. In each case, the conclusion will be the same for what it amounts to is a repudiation of the unconscious as something everybody knows to be useless, infantile, devoid of sense, and altogether impossible and obsolete. After this devaluation, there is nothing to be done but shrug one's shoulders resignedly. To the patient, there seems to be no alternative. If they are to go on living rationally, but to reconstitute as best they can that segment of the collective psyche, which we have called the persona, and quietly give up analysis, trying to forget if possible, and, and quietly forgive up analysis, trying to forget if possible that they possess an unconscious, they will take Faust's words to heart, quoting Faust, this earthly circle I know well enough, towards the beyond the view has been cut off, fool, who directs that way his dazzled eye, contrives himself a double in the sky. Let him look round him here, not stray beyond. To a sound man, this world must need respond. To roam into eternity is vain. What he perceives, he can attain. Thus let him walk along his earth long day. Though phantoms haunt him, let him go his way. And moving on to wheel and woe ascent, he at each moment ever discontent. Beautifully written, um, and 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 so it is. Every every boss is an idiot. Okay, I'm going to read on here. Yeah, such a solution would be perfect if a man were really able to shake off the unconscious, drain it of libido, and render it inactive. But experience shows that it is not possible to drain the energy from the unconscious. It remains active, for it not only contains, but is itself the source of libido from which all the psychic elements flow into us. The thought feelings or feeling thoughts, the still undifferentiated germs of formal thinking and feeling, it is therefore a delusion to think that by some kind of magical theory or method, the unconscious can be finally emptied of libido and thus, as it were, eliminated. One may for a while play with this delusion, but the day comes when one is forced to say with Faust, quote, but now such specterdom is so throngs the air that none knows how to dodge it, none knows where. Though one day greet us with a rational gleam, the night entangles us in webs of dream. We come back happy from the fields of spring, and a bird croaks. Croaks what? Some evil thing. And meshed in superstition, night and morn, it forms and shows itself and comes to warn. 
And we, so scared, stand without friend or kin, and the door creaks and nobody comes in. Anyone here? Care. The answer should be clear, Faust. And you, who are you then? Care. I am just here. Faust, take yourself off. Care. This is where I belong. Faust, take care, Faust. Speak no magic spell. Be strong. Care. Unheard by the outward ear, in the heart I whisper fear. Changing shape from hour to hour, I employ my savage power. Unquote. Paragraph 474. The unconscious cannot be analyzed to a finish and brought to a standstill. Nothing can deprive it of its power for any length of time. To attempt to do so by the method described is to deceive ourselves and is nothing more than ordinary repression in a new guise. Okay, Jordan, you go ahead. Okay, and I think just a, one quick note about care and Faust speaking. Yeah. Um, in essence, we can't not care for any long length of time. Care is always going to come back and go, uh, this yeah. isn't so hot what we're doing. We better, <laughs> we better yeah. go back. Yeah, it's, it, it's there because it's in every every cell of our body, okay? It's right. in our, every cell in our body, like the acorn. Okay, like 475. Acorn. Mephistopheles leaves an avenue open, which should not be overlooked, since it is a real possibility for some people. He tells Faust, who is sick of the madness of magic and would gladly escape from a witch's kitchen. Right, there is one way that needs. No money, no physician, and no witch. Pack up your things and get back to the land, and there begin to dig and ditch. Keep to the narrow round, narrow round, confine your mind, and live on fodder of the simplest kind, a beast among the beasts. And don't forget to use your own dung on the crops you set. And then anyone who finds it possible to live this kind of life will never be in danger of coming to grief and either of the two ways we are discussing for their nature does not compel them to tackle a problem that is beyond their powers. But if ever the great problem should be thrust upon them, this way out will be closed. Right. Okay, so the point is, if you want civilization, you're going to have the collective unconscious working on you. And it's always, it's in our very species it's in our very blood and you know you can't imagine where you would be but the answer is you can't imagine where you would be well and i would add too i mean you look at farmer's wisdom as it were someone who's lived in the land and the land will kill you you know and sure. it'll also love you very much and take care of you right. if you do the same but if you look at the the old farmer and, and and his his young grandson and old farmer's getting tired. So he's, he rests leaning on his shovel and then the younger one starts digging for two people so he can keep going faster and keep on schedule. And, and then all of a sudden he yells up um, the, the hole, it, it's too deep. And the old farmer just chuckles and goes, well, and stop digging. Ah, right. <laughs> so, you know, if we don't stop and regulate ourselves, we can make that hole deeper than it actually needs to be. So, absolutely. Okay. I, uh, this is I'll part, do, B, part yeah. B. You're going to continue on. You want me to go ahead? All right. Go ahead. Part, this is part B. Go ahead. Part B identification with the collective psyche. Paragraph 476. The second way leads to identification with the collective psyche. This amounts to an acceptance of godlikeness, but now exalted into a system. That is to say, one is the fortunate possessor of the great truth, which, which was only waiting to be discovered, of the eschatological knowledge, which spells the healing of, their nation, of the nations. 
this attitude is not necessarily megalomania in direct form, but in the milder and more familiar form of prophetic inspiration and desire for martyrdom. For weak-minded persons who as often as not possess more than their fair share of ambition, vanity, and misplaced naivete, the danger of yielding to this temptation is very great. Access to the collective psyche means a renewal of life for the individual, no matter whether this renewal is felt as pleasant or unpleasant. Everybody would like to hold fast to this renewal. One person because it enhances their life feeling, another because it promises a rich harvest of knowledge. Therefore, both of them, not wishing to deprive themselves of the great treasures that lie buried in the collective psyche, will strive by every means possible to maintain their newly won connection with the primal source of life. And he has the footnote of, I would like to call attention here to an interesting mark of Kant's in, in his lectures on psychology. He speaks of the, in quotes, treasure lying within the field of dim representations, that deep abyss of human knowledge forever beyond our reach. This treasure, if I, as I have demonstrated in my psychology of the unconscious, is the aggregate of all those primordial images in which the libido is invested, or rather, which are self-representations of the libido. And he continues into the finish of the paragraph, identification would seem to be the shortest road to this for the dissolution of the persona in the collective psyche positively invites one to plunge into that ocean of divinity and blot out all memory in its embrace. This piece of mysticism is innate in all better people as longing for the mother, the nostalgia for the source from which we came. Yeah. So, so currently we have a lot of Americans that have a nostalgia for uh the collective that they thought they had but now realize they don't and that will um that will be mystic to them for the rest of their lives but oh by the way we don't live that way anymore that right. as as uh, as was obvious immediately after january 6th it was obvious that we couldn't live the way the people who did, who did the January 6th insurrection. It was obvious that we couldn't live that way right from the beginning, right from the first day. Yeah, because um, you take that to the extreme, they're basically proposing, you know, Mad Max. And right. if I put a 30 pound, 30 pound, not an 80 pound, just a 30 pound beginner pack on any of them, I bet they wouldn't make half a block, much less a mile. <laughs> Justin says... Laugh out loud, I heard prophetic as pathetic inspiration. <laughs> well, well a, lot know, of America, a lot of American men have been living under a pathetic inspiration. There's something to that, Justin. That's a good right. miss here. That's, right. a, that, that's, a young, that's a Jungian slip up here, not a Freudian one, because it probably gives some more credence to what's going to be talking right. about. Okay, paragraph 477. As I have shown in my book on libido, there lie at the root of the regressive longing, which Freud conceives as infantile fixation or the incest wish, a specific value and a specific need which are made explicit in myths. It is precisely the strongest and the best among men, the heroes who give way to their regressive longing and purposely expose themselves to the danger of being devoured by the monster of the maternal abyss. But if a man is a hero, he is a hero because in the final reckon reckoning, he did not let the monster devour him, but subdued it not once, but many times. Victory over the collective psyche alone yields the true value the capture of the horde, the invisible, invincible weapons, the magic talisman, or whatever it, it be that the myth deems most desirable. Anyone who identifies with the collective psyche, 
or in mythological terms, lets himself be devoured by the monster and vanishes in, in it, attains the treasure that the dragon guards, but he does so in spite of himself and to his own greatest harm. 478. The danger, therefore, of falling victim to the collective psyche by identification is not to be minimized. Identification is a retrograde step. One more stupidity has been committed, and on top of that, the principle of individuation is denied and repressed under the cloak of individual deed and in the nebulous conceit that one has discovered what is truly one's own. In, re in reality, one has not discovered one's own at all, but rather the eternal truths and errors of the collective psyche. In the collective psyche, one's true individuality is lost. 479. Actually, really quickly, really quickly. Just Go let ahead. me finish these three lines because then we'll be done. 479, identification with the collective psyche is thus a mistake that, in another form, ends as disastrously as the first way, which led to the separation of the persona from the collective psyche. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Jordan. Yeah, I'm glad you put that last one in, too. Because, I mean, that the collective psyche, one's true individuality is lost. That's the experience of dissolution. You know, you, you literally dissolve. But it's interesting, a quote, I remember, I think it was probably from the book, The Mode in God's Eye. I don't remember. But it was when gazing into the abyss, it's important to remember to keep your foot on the tail of the maw. And, and that's so basically that thing that's standing next to you that you're revering doesn't skittle away in the dark and expand to the tank and come back as this bigger monster right and and so what what we've seen in the last six years is the, the dissolution into a collective maw into thinking that donald trump was the end all be all and people not thinking for themselves. And so it took this election because it's the first time that the American people as a collective have been able to talk back and say, uh, no, we're not doing it that way. So mm -hmm. you guys that got all inflated and th thought you could walk over us uh, and you could decide an election any way you wanted it, and you don't have to pay any attention to the voters, which is what they do in Russia, okay, uh, you people don't know what you're talking about. And so now a lot of, a lot of um, people with the ism of Trump uh, mm -hmm. behind them uh, are have to fall back and they have to go back and look for the treasure. Okay, the treasure in the field, the treasure that Kant and and, mm -hmm. and uh, Jung and many poets have have referred to, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's a wonderful book called The Alchemist about this mm -hmm. fellow, uh, the Spanish fellow who's goes on a on a search for a treasure and uh he he finds a treasure but it isn't what he expected okay and there's another book called uh let's see i think it's called grecian treasure uh and, and it's by irving stone and it's supposedly about the discovery of the historical Troy from the Trojan War, but it's it. But the the Grecian treasure is really not what they discover in the ground, but the wife of Heinrich Schle Schleiman. and you you have to appreciate what she did uh, in that book. It's just a tremendous book. Uh, Heinrich Schleiman was a man who made 
uh, a lot of money he was uh, he, in his day he was the billionaire of the day and he supplied armaments for the uh, Crimean War okay in the 1850s that's what he that's where he made all his money and then he had he had a lifelong dream from his boyhood where his parents had um, or his mother had read him a book when he was like seven years old that was about the Trojan War and Troy. And he got a bee in his bonnet that he wanted to go and find the ruins of the actual Troy. Uh, and uh, by the time he died, he thought he had actually done that, which was not the case. <laughs> but he went out into... Um, the fields, the shards, shards are, are pieces of pots and things like that. And at, at a place called Hisalik in Turkey. And he and his team of workmen started to dig. And over a period of, I, I think, 30 years, maybe, or maybe more, but at least 30 years, they unearthed four civilizations going down. Okay, and they proved that there were four civilizations on the site that Troy was supposed to be. And so by the time Schleiman died, he thought he had actually discovered the ancient Troy. But after his death, it was proven that uh, there, there are at least 11 civilizations on that site, 11, not four. And um, and so I don't think they know yet. Uh, and now we're talking about 170 years later. Um, I, I don't think they even today know which of those uh, civilizations uh, would count as the ancient Troy in the Odyssey. Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful example, because even... Um the metaphor of we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors right. or our forefathers or mothers or what have you. When you look at, um, as they were trying to decipher the Mayan code, Michael D. Code, mm -hmm. Michael D. Coe's book, Breaking the Mayan Code, they discovered that the temples, the pyramids were built upon pyramids, were built upon pyramids. So literally they were adding another strata as it were, on top. And so as they got further down, there were more and more mysteries unre you know, un unleashed that this, this wasn't just a place. Mm -hmm. It was a place that had been many places over long periods of time. Long periods In the of same time. place. Right, right. And so, I, I and so in that case, the Grecian treasure, when Schleiman came back from the Cry Crimean War, he was 54 years old. And he was unmarried and he went to Greece to see a friend and his friend had a, had a daughter who was 17 years old at the time, 17. And Schleiman convinced, I guess, the father to let him marry the 17 year old girl. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually she working with Schleiman for 30 years or 25 years, whatever it was, for a very long time, because they also unearthed Mycenae in, in um, Greece. Um, the, the, so they unearthed Mycenae and they unearthed Troy. And it was actually she who, who then was the treasure and who made Schleiman immortal okay and made their story immortal and the, and so it's just a wonderful book i really urge everyone to go get yourself a copy of the grecian treasure by irving stone it's yeah, i love that book. example and i listened to it on audible by the way i didn't read nice. it but go ahead yeah. i was going to say because even with the breaking of the maya code it was the architect tatiana posteriakov the woman, the mm -hmm. draftsman, who without words was copying 
just what was there, which was actually stepping around Champion and Har the Harvard crowd as to what was supposed to be there. And there, you know, many like Baja and Michotology, so many mistranslations because of them importing Western, Western culture on what they thought should be there. That if it didn't make sense, well, they had to Westernize it so that it made some sense otherwise, et cetera. But when she came in and with the drawings and she started pointing to the different glyphs and then showing groups of the glyphs and then pulled in the language Coptic, it was solved within a couple of years. Yes. And, but it was the woman, you know, who had been there working tirelessly, Tatiana Proskuryakov, and just like his wife. Yeah. So, um, and it very often is the women, and, and now we're seeing more and more women come to the fore in politics, and they're often, you know, excellent leaders because they, they believe in, in compromise and finding compromise, whereas the men will just take you off, will, be, will lead you like being a lem lemming off the well, cliff. And their, and their compromise is often the compromise that keeps things generative instead right. of the I'm now king of the mountain compromise and you bow to me. And right. that's the pecking order, infantile power, whereas they're, they'll, they'll play the compromise like a symbolic language where if it's not generative, it's not a compromise. It's, that's, a, you know, a, that's a compromise of values rather than a compromise of forces at work. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jiro, Jiro says to us, the kid, Heinrich Schleiman, saw the picture, saw the strong walls, the majestic sciatic, sciatic portal. This is what Troy looks like? He asked his father. His father nodded. And this is all destroyed? And... Certainly, his father replied. So his father was saying that it had been destroyed. And Schleiman decided right then, when he was like seven years old, that he wanted to go find it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so Jiro goes on, that I won't believe, said the young Schleiman. When I grow up, I'll find Troya and the treasure of the king. The father laughed. Well, Schleiman did find uh, the treasure, and uh, both of Mycenae and of some of the later civilizations of Troy in his lifetime, and it had immense quantities of gold. And because he was German, uh, he gave um, he gave most of it to the Berlin Museum, <laughs> and and. Uh, half of it had to go to the to the Greek government and, and probably the Turkish government. Uh, and so that is still extant. But the part that he gave to the to the Germans uh, got melted down. It was gold and it got melted down and it was used by the Nazis. Um, and and so it was destroyed. And so you you can no longer see what Schleiman discovered if you go to the Berlin Museum, but you can see it in Athens if you're lucky. Now, in 2004, uh, when they had the Olympics there, my, my wife and I decided we would go to Athens a few months before the Olympics. And I expressly wanted to go see the, the Schleiman or the collection that Schleiman had dug up of Mycenae and, and uh, Troy. And the museum was closed because they were renovating in preparation for the, for the uh, Olympics. So it's kind of the story of my life. I took my daughters to the Louvre one time, and there's a sign on the door that says, closed on Tuesdays. And sure enough, it was Tuesday. <laughs> and we had a plan to drive through Europe and, and we couldn't delay it a day because we had to complete this 3,900 kilometer trip 
in two weeks. And, and so we had this one day for Paris and uh, it happened to be a Tuesday and we couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's funny about the can't get in part because I remember in um, 1999 working on a, a retail remodel that ended up getting commercial remodel of the year and it was um, I was the project architect and you know of course I had been around in the firm long enough that you know, I was left unattended pretty much mm -hmm. except this was the one time where leaving me unattended I, I grew, I'd leap the fence basically. And mm -hmm. until my, my boss, the principal, um, I'm number two, he was number one. He, he drives by and stops and he, he just comes flying back to the office. You know, what in the hell, where in the hell did that come from? And I opened <laughs> the drawings and, and I had drawn the cross section and the perspective on a whole page. You couldn't mm -hmm. miss it. Yeah. And I and I said, I guess you didn't look at my drawings. <laughs> and because I knew I was going against, but it was, it felt right. And the client loved it. Well, he, he searched high and low and high and low and high and low to find a precedent for what I had done. And, <laughs> uh, and so that he could not wrap his head around it. He, he was no stranger to originality. I mean, that's not, that's for sure. But he finally found in the, in the, tank or the mausoleum the basement in versailles um where it's a lot less detailed but they had these inverted entry ar entry arches where the arch was pushed back into the arch rather than a surround that was coming out he goes see you were in versailles i know in 1989 and you spent two days there and this is where it came from and i <laughs> go back and it's like well but that whole section was closed for renovations when I was there. I've never seen that. So, you know, part of me was, well, was I just close enough? I didn't have to actually see it. Right. And so anyway, but the, yeah. um, what so, you expect uh, to be there versus what's actually there. Right. So Jiro says, th this seems to be a true story from when Heinrich Schle Schleiman was 10 and uh, I'm quite sure it's true because uh, Irving Stone's novels are historical novels. And so he uh, has researched them very well, very much like uh, Michener um, researched his novels. And um, yeah, he plays like the King Solomon's Mines, the city of Zen, right. Zinch, all those things. But so yeah, there is a, it's like narrative biography for history. Right. And so there's one about Freud, which is very interesting, too. Uh, Irving Stone novel about Freud. I don't remember what the name of it is offhand, but, but I'm sure you can put it in by, you know, put it in Amazon, Irving Stone and Freud, and you can find that one. And I, I listened to several of those when I was commuting a lot uh, about... <laughs> God, how long ago was this? It was uh, 35 years ago. My gosh, time does fly when you're having fun. But uh, but they they're very powerful novels, and I urge them on you. Now, well, time uh, flies like an arrow, and fruit flies like a banana. Yeah, right. <laughs> so so Mila and uh, someone else, I guess it's uh, Justin are having a discussion about origins here, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but uh, she's talking about uh, an interesting time, which is the time that Jung was writing this, the time of the First World War. So I'll just read uh, what she was saying here. But I, she says, I'll take the risk. Many years ago, there was an Austro-Garska Austro uh, that's where my father is from uh, before the First World War. And the Romanov sisters' family were executed around that time as well. Absolutely. There was a famine which resulted in national cannibalism in Soviet Russia. Okay, so uh, the, the um Romanovs were the were the royal family, the czars of 
of Russia and Tsar Nicholas and his family were captured and uh, executed at the beginning of the Russian Revolution in 1917. And, and that's where the, the famous Anastasia comes from. Right. And the famine, um, Stalin came along and started to steal the grain uh, from the Ukraine. Okay. And this is, this is the story that comes out in Mr. Jones, the movie, Mr. Jones, which is a 2019 movie. I urge everyone to see it. You'll understand the Russian Ukraine war instantly once you watch this movie, because what happened was that Stalin was making himself look very great, but he was uh, stealing the grain uh, from Ukraine. And as we see, the Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world, along with um, the United States Midwest. Um, and uh, so he made a butt shop out of a whole country. I mean, right, grain. right. And he took the grain away from them and, and was starving the, them to the point where they became cannibals. Mm -hmm. And this is lightly touched in this movie, Mr. Jones, but it, it also it involves um, uh, Animal Farm, the, the novel Ma Animal Farm and the writing of the novel, novel Animal Farm, which is why I read it into this YouTube channel. Um, and uh, that's important to bring those um, kinds of pieces up because those, that little excerpt that you just popped into the YouTube, that's no little excerpt. That's yeah. something that's crucial to understanding history and crucial yep. to the heart of the matter of what was there and instead of painting a pretty picture. Um, right. And, it, and all the, these the royal people. families, all these royal families were intermarried and they, they basically had a huge family feud. I mean, uh, the, the, the Windsors, are called Windsor because Queen Elizabeth didn't want to be called Battenberg <laughs> and because <Right. laughs> because uh, Prince Philip was actually descended from uh, the German side of the family <laughs> and uh, and he had to, in his lifetime he uh, somehow got himself named as the Prince of Denmark and Greece and uh, as, as a result of that, he, he had a, a price on his head and he had to escape uh, Greece uh, in an orange crate. That's how he, how he survived at one point. And so all the royal families were having a hell of a time <laughs> with one another <laughs> at that point. And, you know, uh, Queen Victoria had nine children and she married off her all the girls to other other societies. And so there, you know, some married the Germans, some married the uh, Russians, you know, whoever. And uh, wow, uh, there's a there's a history out there for everybody to know. And well, it's, it's exactly it's about this time of World War One, what what Emil is talking about, World War I, that, that Jung was, at, at that time, he was writing, and now we're seeing it play through again. Okay. Well, you know, him escaping in an orange crate. I, I had a client, one of them, actually, my, my first client when I started my, my firm, um, who was at that point 77, and he had escaped from a Russian prison camp in World War II. Yeah. And his he was the most organized human being, and the most simple and truthful person you probably would ever meet. Some people thought he was lying because he would tell the truth so simply that they thought he was up to something. Uh -huh. But he just didn't have time for all that rigor morale. So, but he he realized just by observation in the Russian prison camp that the Russians may be good at higher math, calculus, 
but they suck at arithmetic and order because they had these, they would, they would march in groups of five and except when you had the odd man out at the back line when there were five, 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 and then they had just one, he's supposed to center up. And he just wandered in the back line where he just kind of, and he thought, wow, this is going to be the most difficult thing I've ever done, but I will steal a suitcase, which is the uniform. And um, I will hop this fence where I, you know, privileged to be ice picking right by where they go. And as they pass, I'll just run up and be the last one in line. And it'll be the hardest thing I can, I do, but I'll have to be dis disorganized and for 10 miles and not be organized or they'll know I'm not Russian. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. and he, they walked, marched into town and he just stopped. And two of the guys in the last line turn around and look at him. And he just does, you know, he does his salute and then kind of puts his hands down. Like, you know, I have to go to the bathroom or something. And they're like, whatever. And then he just boop, right into his house. And <laughs> he, he roped up a hammock and they, put him on the bottom of a train car and he rode a hammock under a train car out of Hungary. <laughs> wow. <laughs> out, you know, out well, of the Russian people, camp. And people <laughs> survived in many ways. I, yeah. I met a man who was Jewish, but he, he hid himself as a engineer on the German railway. Oh, and, wow. And, uh, you know, he just, he impersonated a, a Nazi even though he was Jewish and he survived the war. And, mm. and uh, I met him when he was about 89. So I don't know if he's still around, but, but he became a doctor here, here in Arnold, Maryland. Mm. So just, Justin makes the point. Uh, we had lots of Russians and other Slavonic people coming to Denmark during the Bolshevik revolution that's why we have so many gravestones with Cyrillic inscriptions. Okay, well, I think on that, <laughs> we we should decide, who, uh, you know, in order to avoid gravestones, how we're going to live as a as a people in the United States and and in the world yeah. and in the world because it's. It's now global, absolutely. You know, you may want to deny it. You may want to think that we can have an isolated country, but we cannot anymore. It's just not yeah. possible. And the the world itself is becoming more and more like uh, the United States, absolutely, including the English language is becoming more American English, not yeah, and British. People aren't waiting to decide waiting on news of any given war right and actually the maybe one of the only smartest things i think saddam hussein did was economic he, he fired most of his intelligence um agency mm -hmm. and just got like 20 guys subscriptions to cnn <laughs> <'Cause> he'd, <laughs> he'd see everything real time they'd see everything real time and could report with what's right. really going on Right. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up for tonight, and cool. we we will see Jordan on the Advanced Reading Group on Wednesday, and uh, I will be coming in with my hair on fire because I will be teaching in a fifth grade until 3 p.m., and then I have one hour to get home and get myself in front of the camera. Uh, nice. But I will see you on Wednesday and uh, next Sunday. So everyone have a have a great week and uh, and think good thoughts about the end of the election here. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Okay. So 